Matthew chapter 5, we will be looking at verses 1 and 2. So this morning we're going to look at verses 1 and 2, and the next week we'll, be, we'll begin the sermon of Jesus. Our Bible is not an omelet. It's not a magical charm, but a book that we should be reading on a daily basis. One that we should be marking up on a daily basis. Inwardly digesting it and translating it into life itself. Professor J. Phillips Hyatt said, The Word of God is our livelihood in reality. And so this morning we're going to talk about the teacher and how he taught how he taught us, and how we ought to approach the Word of God. This teaching is addressed only to his disciples and not the multitude. We see that coming to chapter 5 where he goes away with his disciples to an intimate place where he can then impart to them his truth. We'll see the very heart of Jesus' teaching really reaching our hearts. A powerful sermon in the next few chapters. Some regard the Sermon on the Mount as the soul of Jesus' teaching. I account it as power, dunamis, because in these chapters, 5 through 7, it changed my life tremendously. This is where I was saved, right here, in these scriptures, when Jesus talked about these subjects, and it just changed my perspective on life completely. And the Lord did a great work in my heart and in my family because of the words of Jesus Christ himself. So the Sermon on the Mount in the New Testament is what the Ten Commandments were in the Old Testament. And so we have a picture of Moses bringing out Ten Commandments for the children of Israel. We have Jesus going up to the mountain with his disciples, giving them his very heart on commandments. It describes how believers in God or of God should live their lives. So if you want to know how to live your life, read these chapters over and over and over again, and you will be blessed by living them out. In this sense, the Sermon on the Mount is pure law. It is pure law. It is not just action, but it is the heart of the law itself. It transfers the offense from the overt act to the actual motive, the motive behind it. And that is probably the most important thing concerning the Word of God. It's wonderful that we go to church, but the real question is, why do you go to church? Why do you go to church? It's wonderful that you serve, but why do you serve? It's wonderful that you teach. But why do you teach? What's the heart behind it? What is the motive? What is the reason? That's where Jesus wants to get. He wants to get at the heart of the issue. Not, not just give you an act to follow. You know, don't steal. So you go around not stealing and you think you're wonderful because you don't steal. But he's saying, why don't you steal? There's a reason why you don't steal. There's a purpose behind it. And it reveals your very heart because you could still have the desire to steal. You might come across something that you've been wanting for a long time and you go to, oh, wait, I'm not supposed to steal. But boy, your hand really wants to grab that and take it with you. There's a heart issue that's going on there. So the pure law, but yet it's the motive behind it. It gets to the heart of the law. Religious leaders had reduced righteousness, our righteous acts, as mere ceremonialism. Just ceremonial acts. Like going to church. Like praying on street corners out loudly. Putting dirt on yourselves and tearing your clothes so that you look like you were pious. And that you were suffering as you were praying and so forth. When really Christ wanted to get to the heart of it. Where a man just stood on the corner and says, man Lord, whoa am I, I'm no good. You know, thank you that you would even listen to my my prayers, you know, because I'm a man of unclean lips. I don't even deserve to be here. That's a heart right there that God loves and would love to bless. The Old Testament idea of the kingdom was only an outward power. And Jesus here will be dealing with the heart itself and giving us power. 
So the Sermon on the Mount declares to us what we are through the grace of God working in our lives. Paul is very clear in telling us twice in chapter 2 about the grace of God and how that we are saved by grace and we are to live by grace. And so this sermon will get to the heart of that grace and how we live by that grace because we can't change our hearts. Only God can change our hearts. Only God through the Holy Spirit can take us and give us new hearts. He can crush the hearts of stone. You know what a heart of stone is like? It's a hardened heart. It's a heart that won't receive. It's a heart that doesn't care. It's a heart that's in rebelliousness. It is a hardened heart. God wants to take that heart and gently, lovingly break it so that it becomes sensitive. You ever get a scab? And it, it, it's healing the wound. And, and sometimes you accidentally, maybe some of you purposely, peel at the scab. You know? And when you peel at the scab, what happens? It becomes sensitive. You know, at the touch, you go, oh, that hurts. Ow, that, I shouldn't do that anymore. You know, well, God has a way of breaking the crust of this world, of our own thoughts and philosophies from our hearts so that our hearts become sensitive to Him. So that we literally do hear Him. We literally do sense him. And so it's a wonderful thing to hear the teacher's words in these next few chapters. He will be teaching on certain things that we all deal with, that the church deals with, the world deals with, and they're great and wonderful principles, good moral teachings that we should all apply to our lives. But there's something behind that, the motive and the heart. And that's what I really want to get at, not just this morning, but the next few weeks. So I'm hoping that you will come back and, and at least come and hear the words of Jesus. If you look at chapter 5, look at chapter 6, just kind of peruse it really quickly. And in chapter 7, I mean, there is not one, there's only four verses that are in black. What color are the rest of the verses? Red. Does anyone know why they're in Red. Is it because they're important? No. Is it because they're Matthew's words? No. It's because they're Jesus' words himself, right? So as we're reading this, you're hearing from Jesus himself. Not from me. I may expound on it a little bit and maybe give you a story to kind of back it up and, and, and make it a little clearer, but they are Jesus' words. And I think that if Jesus were standing right here, we would all be going... Let's hear what he has to say. Uh, we'd be excited first thing because we either were in heaven or <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> but definitely we would be paying attention to his words. I, I think that's sometimes is the problem in church is that we don't pay attention uh, to the words of Jesus. We don't realize that Jesus is speaking to us. You come to church and you think Reuben's speaking to you. I mean, well, I am physically. But really, it's the words that are coming out of my mouth that are Jesus' words in his word. I'm amazed at how many times people have come up to me afterwards and they have said, how did you know I was going through that? Who told you? Like, well, nobody told me anything. You all are coming in here with issues that have been happening on all week long. I'm at home studying the word of God and trying to prepare and praying and seeking God what to say. And then I come and say it, and then you guys go, how did he know that? That's the Holy Spirit. That's God speaking to you. I had one lady come up to me afterwards. She goes, okay, who's talking to you? Because, I mean, you just went through my whole week, and there's no way that you could have known that without someone telling you, you know that gossip is wrong? You shouldn't be gossiping in this church. You know? And I'm like, I haven't talked to anybody about you. Now, I haven't said a thing. It must be God speaking to you. And it usually is God speaking to you. Now, on the other hand, I've had people uh, misquote me. Well, he said this. I'm like, I don't remember saying that. Well, you said that. I don't remember saying that. Now, go back and listen to the tape. And usually they're too busy to do that. They're just going to continue saying, no, you did say that. And I'm like, no, I didn't. And what happens is, is we get interruptions. And that's why it's so important not to interrupt, not to get up, not to walk around. Because this, that slightest movement, that, that little moving out, someone turns around and they just missed it. And I've had that done before. Well, you told me this. I'm like, no, I didn't say that. I'm sure I didn't say that. You know, and it happens all the time because we're not paying attention. 
Sometimes we zone out, right? So then you're like, <sighs> I was teaching a Sunday night. We were in the Old Testament, and our sound guy did that. All of a sudden, I could see, I see everything, by the way. Um, and he's back there, and he's going, <sighs> I can just see his head, and I'm, I'm just teaching, waiting for him to fall forward or something. And all of a sudden, his head hit the back of the wall. Boom! And everybody just stopped and turned around and, and started laughing. Started laughing. I don't take offense to that. I understand that, the, that we have busy lives and work and we get tired and so forth. And if they fell asleep on Paul, then I, I'm privileged that you would fall asleep with me. You know, so at least you get a good, good morning nap, if anything. But we do get sidetracked. And, and so it's important that we listen to one another. Uh, it's like a relationship. If I'm not listening to what my wife is saying, I totally miss it. And I miss it a lot. <laughs> and... and <laughs> And she misses what I'm saying a lot, too, because we're really not listening to each other. What are we doing? We're trying to give you our side. We're telling to tell you the way it is and, and so forth. And we're not listening to what they are saying. So in, in, in these teachings, these several chapters, we're going to find uh, the subject of murder. But not just murder, but, but the intent, the motive behind murder. That, that hatred in the heart is murder. Boy, if you have hatred in your heart for someone, get rid of it. Because you are a murderer. And no murderer can enter the kingdom of God, Jesus will say. You got to get rid of that. You got to give it to Jesus. Adultery. Adultery. Now I can say that in front of all of you and think no one's committing <laughs> adultery. But you know what? You just never know. Because adultery is not a sin that you just kind of throw out there. It is a very sneaky sin. It is a sin that is kept behind the doors and, and very, very um, secretively. Um, you become covert in that type of sin. You learn how to lie. You learn how to tell stories. You learn how to disguise. I mean, it is a very sneaky sin. But it's the issue of the heart because if you lust for someone, you've committed adultery. We're going to see divorce, oaths, and that's one we've gotten away from uh, for years. Uh, now we have to sign contracts, and even signing a contract doesn't mean anything. But there was a day when you said, I'll do that, and I believed you. And now when someone says, I'll do that, and in my head I'm saying, Lord willing, <laughs> Lord willing, and because we don't keep our oaths anymore. And there's, there's a hard issue behind that. Some, sometimes, you know, good intentions, I want to do it, I want to do everything, but you just know you can't. And so being, being honest uh, retaliation, love, charitable deeds, how we should do our charitable deeds, how we should pray, how should we fast, wealth. These are the words of Jesus talking about wealth and prosperity. You can read Paul's idea of wealth and being rich and your responsibilities and the good instructions. But Jesus will tell us exactly in, in what in chapter 6, verse 19, not to lay up for ourselves treasures on earth. That's pretty clear. Don't make it your life to just gain riches. There's more to life than that. So we'll talk about wealth. Judging, proper judging, not that we shouldn't judge. And a lot of other issues, as I shared, life-changing issues that, that definitely will change your life and you will be blessed tremendously. So as we've been going through these chapters... We've been looking at the king, and Matthew has been presenting him in different ways. Chapter 1, we saw his genealogy. He's presenting his ancestry, proving to us that he's the king. Chapter 2, his birth as a king. Chapter 3, his announcement, acknowledgement, and anointing as a king. Chapter 4, we saw his, his testing by Satan himself, his approval as a king. And now chapter 5, we have the king sitting on his throne on the mountain, giving his constitution to his disciples, how we as men and women should be living our lives. Chapter 5 deals with the relationship of Jesus and the law. Chapter 6 deals with our relationship with God. Chapter 7 deals with our relationship with man. And those are relationships that, that, that we all deal with in one form or another. The Sermon on the Mount is about driving us to Christ. Because of sin. And when we read these few chapters, you're going to realize, I'm a sinner. 
and I've fallen short of God's glory. Boy, am I a murderer. Boy, am I an adulterer. Boy, do I not pray. Boy, do I seek after wealth. You're going to realize that there's a lot of sin in our lives. And the only place we can go and run to and hide and cling to is Jesus. He's the only one that will save us from our sins. But also directing us in a way of living, living for Christ. And that way is to live by grace. Because I am an adulterer, and so I confess it to my Savior. And He forgives me. Because I do hate from time to time that I confess it, and He forgives me. And then I can move on and continue to serve Him. So a life of confessing and living by grace. So this morning's theme is the teacher, Jesus, as He teaches. How does He teach? How does He teach? How do we approach the teachings of the Bible? When we look at chapter 4, verse 25, He kind of starts there, That really, the Sermon on the Mount. Look, look at verse 25. Great multitudes followed Him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea. And then He said they, they followed and, and He taught in chapter 5. Uh, You notice the sequence that they followed him or they went up with him and then he sat them down and he began to teach them. When you get to chapter 7, he reverses that order, which is interesting. Kind of like in the book of Ruth, you'll you'll find that little picture in there where where you see uh, the listing of Naomi's sons. And then all of a sudden, as they're going through the chapters, they list the sons again, but they're in reverse order. And what it's doing is it's saying, look, this is where it began. And this is where it ends. He almost outlines a chapter for you. And this is what's happening here. They went up with Jesus and he taught them. By the time we get to chapter 8, they're going, he's teaching them and then they're going down. The end of the Sermon on the Mount right there. And so important uh, verses for us to look at and really contemplate for our lives. So let's look at uh, verses 1 and 2, the Sermon on the Mount, the teacher. Jesus Christ himself. And when you think about the teacher, remember he's not just a man, but he's God in the flesh, right? And being God in the flesh, think of God. God should know all things. He knows all things from beginning to end. And if he knows all things, and he is God, and he is greater than man itself because he created man, we should listen to him. He has some wisdom. He's got some insight. And that insight and wisdom and principles and laws and commandments and all of those things are good for us to live on this earth. And so he's preparing to teach his disciples and potential disciples there in Israel. You can also find the Sermon on the Mount in Luke chapter 6 if you want to do a cross reference and and read it and see what the similarities are between Luke's account and Matthew's chapter 6, 20 through 49. And seeing the multitude verse when he went up on the mountain or a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. So seeing the multitude, and there were probably a huge number of disciples following him at this time for various reasons, many of them traveling 200 miles just to see him. We went to the inductive Bible study several weeks ago. Dan Frenfrock was talking about some pastors that had come out to the conference and to learn how to teach the Bible And as these pastors uh, were learning, they were really blessed by the whole message, blessed by the speakers and so forth. So they came up afterwards and said, hey, we'd like you to come and share with our church uh, on Wednesday night. Would you do that for us? And they thought, wow, that's a blessing, an open door. Let's go in and let's, you know, preach the gospel message and so forth. So they said, yeah, we'll go with you. All right. So they got in the vehicle. They traveled four hours to get to their church. It's a long way to go. They thought it was just around the corner. These guys walked the four hours to get to this event. It's amazing what people will do when they're hungering the Word of God. How they will read it. How they will study it. How they will love it. I I love the Word of God. There's just a passion that God has given me for it. Not only do I have this study where I'm preparing for Sunday morning, I also prepare for, for Wednesday night. And you would think, well, that's enough studying for the week, right? Well, I also do my devotions. 
And then I also have a side study that I'm doing. I'm studying the book of James right now just personally, just really looking at all the words, all the phrases, and really getting down to, to the nitty-gritty and, and so forth and looking and reading at commentaries. And it's just I'm loving it. I just love the Word of God. And when you love the Word of God like that, especially when you realize it is God's Word, it is powerful, and it can do some amazing things. I remember when I got saved, I thought, as I read the book of Acts, I thought, wow, I'm going to see some miracles. I mean, if this is true, I'm going to see some miracles. I'm going to see some amazing things. I believed it. People don't believe that anymore. Guess what? They don't see much. But when you believe it, God gives you the privilege of seeing it. I have seen miracles. I have seen lives changed. I've also seen lives go backwards too. And, and the word of God is true in every which way. It is powerful. Seeing the multitude, many coming, 200 miles away, just to hear him, see him, and watch a miracle happen. And he went up on a mountain, it says. Which mountain did he teach from? It doesn't say. We don't know which mountain, and we can't add to it, so we have to just say it was a mountain. It was a place that obviously had a vantage point for addressing large crowds of disciples. And so he may have sat up on the hill there a little bit as they all uh, stood or sat. Well, he stood, and no, he sat, and they stood on, 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 in the bottom of the mountain there. And so as he sat there, probably by the Sea of Galilee, when I was in Israel, Bob Probert in 2004 took us to this area somewhere where they believe that uh, he gave the Beatitudes, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And so I literally sat there, and it would be easy for you to sit on the higher part of the hill, and the people would stand there, and you could still see everyone there. It was amazing. Uh, I mean, just imagine, I mean, the chances of me standing right where Jesus was. It, it, it could have been where Jesus sat with his disciples. So I was really excited. And then we read the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. It was like, wow, Lord, this is awesome to be right where you were thousands of years earlier. And you could see the Sea of Galilee, a beautiful sea of water and the mountain ranges and so forth. Just a beautiful place to be. Now, it's interesting here that that one commentator calls, the Mount, uh, calls it the Mount of Beatitudes, the Sinai of the New Testament. And so he, he, he relates it to the story of Moses. You know how Moses was giving the law from Mount Sinai to the people? Here we have Jesus instructing the people from the mountain. Kind of very similar. Moses was giving the law. Jesus was giving grace to the children uh, <clears throat> of Israel. Then you find this great disclosure in the gospel of the parallels of the five books of the law where Matthew suggests um, the heart of the law. <clears throat> so as they're on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. <clears throat> Again, Jesus sat, they stood. That was the custom back then. So normally we stand, you get to be comfortable because we don't want you uncomfortable but it's fine if I'm uncomfortable. Jesus did the opposite. He sat down and got comfortable. The disciples stood because they wanted to hear what he had to say. So they, he was seated and disciples came to him. And then we come to verse 2. Then he opened his mouth and taught them saying, we're going to stop there. I want to talk about how he taught. The imperfect Tense here signifies he began to teach them. So they, they, they came, they, they, they stood, and he began to teach them the Sermon on the Mount. And emphasizing the importance of the teaching here. In the Greek, this taught them is emphasizing the importance of that message. It was important information that he was giving to them. It wasn't something that they could just hear and discard, but it was something they need to really listen to and make their own and keep it and live by it. So when Jesus opened his mouth, he opened it so that they would hear and that they would understand and they would apply it to their hearts. So he began to teach. Now I want to expound on that. He began to teach. A teacher teaching. Again, this is God in the flesh teaching. So he has something to say. Let me expound on how we should approach the Word of God. The Word of God is 
speaking of Jesus, right? It's all about Jesus. Remember when he talked to the religious leaders and basically said, you guys search out the scriptures. You're in the scriptures and you're trying to interpret them and understand them. He says, but you're missing it. The scriptures speak of me, of Jesus. So it's all about the teacher. The word of God is the teacher. John 1 says, in the beginning was a word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the word. Not one word will pass away, not one little dot, not one little tittle, not one little line. It'll be forever. Why? Because it's Jesus. He's the living word of God. Now it's important that we interpret his words correctly. I don't know how many times I hear people misquoting scripture out of context, misapplying it when it's a narrative and not a commandment. And I'll describe those things in a minute. And now, let me give you an example of that. Jesus, in the Gospels, John talks about washing the feet of disciples. So John is, is retelling that story of how he washed the feet of his disciples. Someone comes along and says, oh, we should be washing the feet of one another. So they make a commandment out of it, and that's not what it was. It wasn't a command for us to wash each other's feet. You're not going to wash my feet, and I'm definitely not going to wash your feet. Have you seen some of those big toes? You know? <laughs> I'm thinking of the vitamin that you can take to grow nails. <laughs> you go to the book of Acts, you find one reference of foot washing. In the epistles, nothing is said that you should wash your feet. So we've made a commandment of something that was just in a narrative. Incorrect. We don't need to do that. And so we have to understand how to approach the Word of God and properly interpret the Word of God. There are basically five book types in scriptures. Now you can probably find one or two more, but the basic ones are these. And, and I gave you that handout. These are the basic ones that you need to understand. There are narratives in the Bible. There are epistles. There are poetries. And there are parables. And then there are prophecies. Now why am I telling you this? Because I'm here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. In order to equip you, you have to understand the Word of God and how to apply it to your life so you could better equip yourself for that work. Okay, I did this with my sons as they were growing up. I taught them how to read their Bible. We've gone to inductive Bible classes. I encourage them to continue to go. I just went to one as a pastor of another church and I sat through the whole study. It's refreshing. It reminds you of things. So these are the five basic things. Narrative, epistles, poetry, parables, and prophecies. Get, get the CD if you need to. First one is narrative. We all know what a narrative is, right? You went to school. If you didn't go to school, then I'll tell you what a narrative is. It's just a story form. It's not a metaphor. It's just telling you what took place. I'll give you an example. If Virginia opened that door and walked in here, and then made a left for her and sat on the chair and then looked up at me. I would probably say, Virginia, open that door. She walked over to the chairs and she looked up at me. That's just the narrative of what happened. Now, some will misinterpret that metaphorically. And they'll go, a woman was challenged by an opportunity many choices in life she could have gone in many directions you know, but she decided to go in one direction and that direction brought comfort as she sat you know and you can like come up with all this stuff well, wait a minute this wasn't even a woman it's speaking of humanity as it walked through the door and in humanity Life is difficult with many choices. You know, and you just like can come up with all these thoughts. And we're all different. We all view things differently. I remember when I taught years ago the, the Beatitudes. And we came to the very first Beatitude there in, in chapter 5 verse 1. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And now Jesus is speaking to his disciples spiritually. He's talking about kingdom teachings. People often look at that as poverty the poor people in the world, the homeless and so forth. And, and she was just arguing with me about, he's talking about the homeless. No, he's not. You misinterpret that. 
He's not talking about the homeless. First, he's talking to his disciples. and He's talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about the spirit there and the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about the homeless. So proper interpretation is, is very, very important. Narrative form. History. You, you find this in the Gospels. Narrative. You also find it in Genesis, the five books of the Bible, Exodus, Numbers, also recorded in the Old Testament, Kings. These are just narratives retelling the historical events that took place at that time. Okay, that's a narrative. First five books are narratives. The Gospels are narratives. So when you read those books, you're reading a narrative. Now within that narrative, you can have some of these things. And so you need to understand these, these other uh, points also because within the narrative you can have instruction you can have uh, a, you, you can have poetry in there you can have pro prophetic teaching like in Matthew chapter 24 so you have to understand that the next one is the epistles now the epistles are little letters written to churches and so Paul went about starting churches and then he wrote to those churches because there was air coming into the churches and he had to correct them or things were confusing, and so he had to give them some order. Just depends. So we call them instructional or exhortive. So when you're reading the epistles, you are logically, or lo it's a logical development of a subject, of a thought. And so you find this in the letters of Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Peter's writings, James, John, and Jude. Just all those epistles, only in the New Testament. Because he's giving us instructions. So as you read those epistles, God is trying to instruct you in your own life. He's trying to exhort you. You know what exhortment means, right? Exhort you to do it. Don't just hear it and let it fall, but actually do it and then be blessed by it. Those are epistles. Instructional, exhortive. Then there is poetry. Now we all know poetry. You know, roses are red, violets are blue. I forget all. There's so many endings to that. We'll all be blue in the face. So poetry, an arrangement of ideas and words and patterns. And you see that in Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Boy, when you read the Song of Solomon as a married couple, you see all these picturesque forms there for your relationship. You know, your wife could be like a gazelle bouncing around, so beautiful, you know and so forth. And when you read Proverbs, there's wisdom there and he gives you these, these picture forms of what wisdom is. The Proverbs 31 woman and, and so forth. And of course the Psalms and then Job himself. So those are poetries. Poetries. And then parables. We find the, the parables in the Gospels. We find a few parables in, in the Old Testament teachings also. But parables are basically a, a truth that God is trying to get across to us. For instance, God will only deal with Israel during the time of Jesus. And then he's going to deal with the Gentiles. And there's a story, remember when Jesus is walking down the road and he sees a, a fig tree and there's no fruit on it. And then he comes back and he curses that fig tree. That's a parable. He's giving us an idea that this fig tree, whatever it represents, he's cursing. Well, it represents Israel. And there is no fruit with Israel at this moment, so he's cursing them for now. And we see parables like that. They're bringing about a certain truth to us. And so as you read the parables, understand there's a truth there. And then the last one is prophecy. Now we love that one, right? We all want to know prophecy. When's the end coming? When's the rapture? When can I expect it? Can I just sit back and relax now? You know, and so we want to know the future events that are taking place. Is Obama the Antichrist? Is Hillary the antichrist -y? You know, you know, you see the small antichrist. You know, I mean, we want to know all this stuff. It's amazing how prophecy will draw older people. Young people don't care about prophecy. They want to live now. <laughs> let's have fun. Let's do it now. Let's, let's, let's get it done. And prophecy, I'll, I'll worry about later on down the road. I've gone to so many prophecy conferences at, at Chino Hills. And when you go there, you notice everyone's great haired. <laughs> You know, during those and the political conferences, everyone's great hair too. Usually in, in at those uh, conferences, because it's usually when you're older, you start worrying about the end times and and where's our world going and so forth. But prophecy is found basically in the major and minor prophets in the Old Testament. 
Now the major major prophets are like Dan, like Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, the bigger books. That's all it's saying when it says majors. There's a major amount of chapters. Minor chapters are the other books like Malachi. Malachi is a small, Zephaniah, Obadiah, 24 verses. You know. Those are minor <clears throat> prophets. And then also, of course, in the New Testament, you have the book of Revelation, right? The book that um, we know how the world is coming to an end through that book. But boy, when you start reading commentaries, it's amazing all the different interpretations of the book of Revelation. There are pastors that won't even touch it. I know when, when I was at a, the church before this at Calvary, um, he had not taught on the book of Revelation. He, it was one area he didn't want to go through. I love the book of Revelation. In fact, I love the way David Guzik interprets it. He interprets it very literally, very literally. He, he doesn't do it metaphorically, and he just basically says what's there and nothing more because we don't have any idea. Now remember... When you interpret the scriptures, interpret it literally. Because literally, Virginia walked through the door, sat on the chairs, and looked at me. We don't know her motives. She could have been upset at me, like normal. <laughs> or she could have been, in, you know, I don't know, upset at the kids. We just don't know. That's a lot of subjective information that we're adding in there. So observe it literally. Now, when I say literally, know that it's a narrative. That's what it is. If it's instructional, it's instructional. If it's a metaphor, it's a metaphor. Inst interpret it literally. So when Jesus said, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times I wanted to gather you as a hen gathers his chicks, that's a metaphor. He's not saying God is a hen and you're a bunch of chickens. It's a metaphor to say, I wanted you for myself. I wanted to gather you to the truth, to the kingdom of heaven. That's what he's saying. I had one guy tell me that. That's no, God is a hen, you know. God's a hen. Like, seriously? That's what you're saying? No. You've got to be careful how you interpret the Scriptures. That's why I love the Calvary Chapel style. I really do. I fell in love with it. You know, when I got saved, I had been the Catholic most of my life. And I got saved in my company vehicle. I've never been to a Christian church. So I'm starting to listen to the radio. And I'm listening to, like, Greg Laurie, listening to Calvary Chapel pastors, but I'm also listening to like faith pastors, wealth pastors. I'm talking about uh, uh, African-American church pastors, you know, when they're screaming and yelling the whole, whole time, you know, that's the Lord says. And you're like, oh, wow, okay, so that's how you preach. That's the way it's supposed to be, you know. So, I mean, I could have went in any direction. But for some reason, I fell in love with the Calvary style because they went through the Bible, I was listening to Charles Stanley this morning, and I mean, he's a great teacher. I like him. But he, he came up this morning and says, okay, well, <clears throat> I was picking my text this week, and I just kind of thought, what scripture is, is the most important scripture to me? Which one do I think is, is really the best scripture? Maybe the, out of all the others. And I came across this one. And I'm thinking, that, that, that's not going through the Bible. That's a topical, and, and then it's a topical based upon what he feels is the best scripture. It's like, I want to know what God is saying. I want to know what Jesus is saying. Nothing against Charles Stanley. He's a great teacher. I love his teaching. Very sound, very simple, and very clear. But his subjects change from here and there. I'm not getting the word of God. And so I loved Calvary because I was getting the word of God. Isaiah talks about the children of Israel, <clears throat> how they were backsliding, how they were into idolatry. And he encouraged them to get back to the word of God. And this is what he said. The word of the Lord was to them, to those backsliders, those idolaters. He says, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. That they might go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and caught. How would they be broken? How would be snared and caught? Through the word of God. As they went through it, they would realize their sin. Many of kings were told the word of God, and many of them said, we have sinned, and we need to get back to the word of God. Many have rejected and tried to burn it. We need to be in the word of God, precept upon precept, line upon line. Paul said this in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God, so Paul is saying at that moment when he wrote that, 
And whatever epistles were, that were ready, whatever Old Testament documents they had, he said, I've declared to you all of it. All of it. So how important is it for us to know the Word of God? Very important. Very important. This uh, individual that I've been sharing with you, who's 86 years old, uh, we're like-minded. He's 86, I'm 53. And, and we think alike. Why? Because he's read the Word. I've read the Word. And we agree on its interpretation. And we would all agree if we were to read the Word of God. Where does division come? Where do arguments start? From a lack of reading the Word of God. Stop listening to people that have not read the Word of God. Get rid of them. Go to the source yourself. Oh, but I heard someone say, the Genesis chapter and verse this, and I can't remember what it was, but this is what it said. And you're going, really? Wow. Stop it. Just for, you know what? If you don't give me the chapter and verse so I can look at it myself, don't even talk about it because that, that's useless. Give me the scripture reference. Show me in the Bible. And then I'll make a decision on what it, what it says. And then basically taking these five uh, ways of looking at it, you come up with a proper balanced decision on what it says. <clears throat> Jesus uh, had the disciples for three years. And what did he teach? He, he taught a message of repentance because the kingdom of God is at hand. And that really is the central message of the Gospels, of the Bible, is to, that men need to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And he took John's message and he just took that message on. Peter did the same thing in Acts and Paul did. And we should too. The central message of the Gospel is for us to reach the lost. Nepal is, is wonderful. Let's go help them. Let's, we can't rebuild their, Nepal. We'll be there forever. But we can reach one individual or a family with the gospel message. And by changing them, they can change others and the gospel can spread in an idolatrous nation. That's why we're going. That's why I'm excited about going. Uh, I'm excited that we actually get to be a part of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa and joining Montebello and us and other uh, churches to go over there and preach the gospel message through their lives. So Jesus taught that central message. Now here's a couple of things that you need to be warned of. I've done it in the past to a certain degree. You've heard it on the TV. You've heard it on the radio. We just need to be aware of it and careful that we don't make it you know, our main objective when we're studying the Word of God is that we don't look at the Word of God as an advice-centered book. We're just not trying to find advice. Let's go to the Bible and let's get some, some good advice, some self-help. It's not what it's about. Jesus is the central message, okay? So you might get good advice in there, but don't forget Jesus. He's the one that has the advice. He's the one that helps with the advice. He's the one that gives you the strength to follow the advice. You need him in the center of all of that itself. Otherwise, you just become a person. And I know someone like this, and I finally confronted them because they got into, uh, into this holistic healing and natural herbs and things like that. And next thing you know is that's all they talked about. And I asked them a question about Jesus, and they're like, oh, I can't read the Bible. It's too hard for me to understand. And I'm like, I've read some of those PhD writings on herbs. You know, that's ridiculous sometimes. I don't even know what they're talking about. You're kidding me, right? Well, yeah, I don't have time for that. And so you lose the Jesus when it's only advice centered. So be, care of, be, care, be careful of advice centered. Now, you, you might be saying, but you're giving us advice. <laughs> I am. But let's not make that the only thing. I'm also giving you Jesus at the same time. Virtue centered preaching where you're just focusing on motivating people. So if this church all of a sudden becomes a, motive, let, let's just go to Nepal. It's all about Nepal. It's all about this and it's all about that. But it's, again, never Christ-centered. Uh, you can be a Daniel. You can dare to be a fighter like Goliath. And you can be a Moses. And, but where's Jesus in all of that? you got to mix the both together. Also, it can be politically centered. There are churches that get very political. Now, we are political here. And like I said, I admit it, that we have a little bit of this in all of our messages here and there. But again, let's not make it the main thing. We want to be politically um, active in our society, but we don't want it to just be political. So you have to remember, Christ returns. There's no more United States. 
There's no more Republican. There's no more Democrat. It's done with. Jesus is our Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He'll be our president. He'll be our prime minister. He will be all in all for us. And so it's about knowing who he is. And then we'll know how to vote politically. We will vote conservatively. We will vote for righteousness and so forth. But don't go around pushing only politics. You get people mad. They get upset. You cause fights. You cause separation and so forth. You can't do that. That's not scriptural when you get to that point. It tickles ears. It definitely does. Especially, as I said, the older Usually, usually the older start thinking about the end of life and why we're here, and what we've really done, and where our world's coming to, what's the cost of everything. When you've got to pay $9 for a, for a cheeseburger and fries, you're going, what's going on here? It's got to be Obama's fault because taxes are high. The minimum wage until you get into all of that stuff. And now that's all you do. You're a grumpy old man talking about hamburgers and taxes. Where's Jesus in that? Well, Jesus is coming back. He'll take care of those guys. <laughs> you know? See, we need to keep Jesus the focus. And then again, uh, apocalyptic centered, where all you're talking about is the end times. Um, interpreting the day that we're living and when it's going to happen and so forth. Even church-centered preaching, where you focus on the congregant. The vision of the local church. What's our vision? What's our purpose here? When that's all we do. People every year, what's our vision? Same as it was last year. Preach through the word of God. Get people to know Jesus. But what's our purpose? That is our purpose. No, no. no we have a, have a purpose as a church. Uh, have you done the demographics of, of the church itself? You know who, who are in your church and what's the age group and, and what's their objectives and what's their motives? And I'm like, no, I haven't done any of that. I'm just letting Jesus take care of it. Oh, that is, that's not going to work. Really? You're saying Jesus can't take care of it? So I've got to take care of it. We've got to bring in the demographics and take all the statistics and all that stuff. And Jesus said, oh, well, they're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> you know? It doesn't make any sense. We, we have to bring Jesus in the core of it all. Let me close. <clears throat> because by this time you're going, okay, I got it. A young believer was discouraged in his attempt to read and remember the things in the Bible. I know I've been there, and I know you've been there too, where you read something, and you're like, I don't understand it. In fact, I forgot what I read yesterday. And so a wise pastor said, take to heart, when you pour water over a strainer, no matter how much you pour, you don't collect much, but at least you end up with a clean strainer. All right? So at least you get a clean strainer. You might not remember everything. You might not get much. But at least it go, it's going through you. And it's cleaning what's there. And you let the Holy Spirit take that and use it to change you.